Good afternoon, everyone. As you know, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's just pause for a moment of silence. And utilize 1 John 1 9 to prepare ourselves. As you know, the scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we do this, of course, to restore fellowship with God. Perchance, if we've committed any sins, be it mental, overt, or verbal, that places us outside of fellowship with God, thereby nullifying the empowerment or enablement of God the Holy Spirit. So let's just pause and pray, and then I'll open with prayer. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to examine your word this afternoon. And if there's anything bothering us or distracting us, I just pray that we would lay those aside for the moment so that we can intake your word. We know that this is vital for stability, as well as transformation and growth and maturity. So, Father, we are praying all of these things and pleading these things in Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen. All right, let's move, move through uh, Revelation. We left off on verse 6, and so I'm going to pick up from verse 6 just so that we can follow the flow of the author's intention here. So here we have verse 6, which says the following. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And I pulled up some information regarding the Nicolaitans. And this is what I discovered. It's, let me see. I have it here somewhere. Just give me a moment. I have a lot of things here. <clears throat> okay, here it is. The Nicolaitans come from the Greek word meaning adherents of Nicholas. And so Nico is defined as a conquest or victory over others. And the second part, lay, means people. And the last part, tes, represents the word the. So taken together, it represents, the, the word Nicolaitans means someone who is a conqueror or victor a person who destroys the people. And so it's interesting, the Nicolaitans are only referenced twice in scripture, which is why it's very difficult to find anything with regards to the Nicolaitans. And so the first time they appear is in God's spiritual assessment of the Ephesian church. He commends them by stating that they hate the works of these people, which he too also hates, Revelation 2.6, right here. The doctrines taught by them are also mentioned a few verses later when the Pergamus church is called to repent because they firmly believe in this group's teachings. We find this in verse 15. So it has some flawed doctrines. And so Jesus Christ will make this known as we move forward in this chapter. But it's interesting because as we're moving through Revelation, you're going to see some things. This is S eschatological in material, which means end time events, doctrines, and beliefs. And so even though this is forward uh, speaking, it's interesting because there's a lot of principles and truths that are found in this book itself, which not only refers to the future, but it can help us now as a local church, as a Bible-believing assembly, where we're listening to the words of God, and making adjustments because like here we're seeing that this you have verse 6 chapter 2 verse 6 that you hate the deeds of the nicolaitans which i also hate and later on he's going to talk about their teachings and so 
as we approach the end times, as we move closer and closer to the end times itself, you're going to discover that a lot of the things that God really ab abhors is flawed teachings, things that do not line up with his doctrines and truth, which is why it is imperative to know what the word of God says, not only for spiritual edification, but so that God will not discipline you. God will not discipline us as an assembly, as a group of believers, or just as an individual. Because if you start talking about things that are not lined up with God's word, then you run the risk of being disciplined. And so we don't want to do this. We don't want to run the risk of saying something that's not there. Remember, as I've been saying on Tuesdays and Thursdays and even Wednesdays, we want to see what's there and see what's not there. It's the not there that is also very, very important because the not there is saying it basically suggests that we don't want to say it's there in the text when in fact it's not, because then you stuff things into God's mouth when it's not there. That's called eisegesis, and you're putting things into God's word, which is not there. And Revelation, the very last book, the very tail end of the book says, if you add to this book, he will add to the plagues. And so it's the idea of don't ever tamper with my word. And which is why James says, not all of you should be teachers, because it's a huge responsibility. You don't want to say something God's not saying. So that's why, as we move through this, you'll notice a, a common thread just in the book of Revelation itself. So here, what uh, Jesus says here in verse 6, at least the Lord could positively say, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were heretic, were heretical group that troubled the churches at Ephesus and Pergamum. <clears throat> Verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, he will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. My thoughts here on the bottom, at least the Lord could positively say, okay, this is the same thing from last week. I added our last slide. That's not the one I want. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things say the first and the last who was dead and came to life. John is instructed to write to the angel of the church. And I think it's the pastor in the churches that are, in chapters two and three, based on who Jesus is, Jesus himself, the first and the last, Isaiah 41, four, you can check this out, 44, six, 48, 12, reminds those facing death, those who are faced with life-threatening situations, Revelation 2.10, that he was dead and came to life. So the idea is that as we're facing these challenges and difficulties, and we'll have to remind, remember that during the time that this was written and during the times of the church age moving forward, there's going to be similar things that the churches face, whether it's a church during this time or the church moving forward. And we're seeing this today, right? We're seeing the ongoing fighting going back and forth, whether we're talking about Middle East or around the world, there is life-threatening situations <clears throat> so one way John communicates this way to uh, encourage the churches, pardon me, I just need, I got a tickle in my throat, is by reminding them <clears throat> he was the one who was dead and came to life. Now, how could that be an encouragement when you're going through hardship? Because we're serving a, a Lord, our Lord, who at one time was dead and came back to life. So when we factor that in, when we pause for a moment and we say, well, it's not in vain. Our service to God is not in vain. It's hard, but it's not impossible. It's sacrificial. It takes resources. It takes time, energy, and commitment. 
But is he worth it? Is, is God worth it? Is God the son worth it? Yes, yes, and yes. And we're, we're told that he was at one time dead and came back to life. We know based on scriptures, uh, based on studying together, based on each and every year during Resurrection Sunday, he died and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, right? So when we see things like this, it should reverberate inside our soul and remind us that, you know, when we're pulling together, when we're studying, whether you're online now, listening to this on YouTube later on, when you're going through hardship or when you're working together in a church context or a family context or a friendship context, you know, when you're being patient with each other, when you're extending grace and grace and more grace to your family members, to loved ones, to your friends, and you're sitting there saying, I can't do this anymore. Is it really worth it? The only thing we can do is default to the doctrines that we've studied before. And yes, if he's forgiven us, we can forgive others. If he's extended grace to us, we can extend grace to others. So that when we're about to give up and we just say, I want to throw in the towel, we can recall the person who was dead and came back to life is the same person, the same Lord, the same God who loves us and will one day in the near future reward us. Now, it's not that we should aim for rewards. I can't wait to be rewarded by God. He does motivate us by telling us we will receive crowns. But if you think about it, the big picture of salvation is already worthwhile and it's worth working for. And not that we would um, earn it or merit salvation, but it's because it's ours already the moment you place your faith in him. So he reminds those facing possible death that he was dead and came back to life. So he says, look, I have overcome death. I conquered death. You're on my side. You're my child. You're my son. You're my daughter. Don't worry about it. I've got this. So our focus should be on him, the Lord who came back to, came back to life and basically is reminding us in the record itself, the Bible. He's reminding us, look, I came back to life. Even death couldn't hold me down. Satan thought he can hold me down. He thought that he was going to be able to take me out and circumvent the salvation that is pre-planned in eternity past with the Father, Holy Spirit, and God the Son. No, he won. Satan thought he won, but God in reality was the one who won because he rose on the third day and Satan wasn't expecting that. So we're on the winning team, folks. We already won. We've read the scriptures. We know we've already won because God won. And so he can say things like this and it'll make, uh, it should make an impact in our heart, soul, and mind when we read things like this. Who was dead and came back to life? These things says the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Lord Jesus Christ who was dead and came back to life. He said, well, don't worry about it. I've got your back, Tess. I've got your back, Jasmine. I've got your back, Winston. I've got your back, Fred. I've got your back, Theta. I got your back, Sarah, Arnie. I've got your back, all of you. I don't want to forget anybody, but it goes on and on and on. And he says, who was dead and came back to life. So the point being is, no matter what you're going through, he's on your side. You're going to win. You already won because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So when we look at this, Jesus Christ who came back to life, and you think about that, every other system out there, the founder of that faith, be it Buddhism, Confucianism, they're all dead and they remain dead in their grave, not Jesus Christ. You might be thinking, well, I already know this stuff, Pastor Freddie. Well, yes, but it's here again reminding us that when you're in your home and nobody else knows this, and when you're praying and you're saying, Lord, please help me, he reminds us, look, give it a little time. I'm orchestrating the details in your life, your friend's life, your family's life. Hang in there. The person who was dead came back to life. That's me, the Lord Jesus Christ, the first and the last. And so when you go to this verse, it should impact you in such a way that you can say you know what that's true 
He conquered death. If he can conquer death, he can hear my prayers. If he conquered death, he can answer my prayers. If he conquered death, he can cause all things to work together for good. Because the truth is, we sometimes are so, we're so familiar with those verses that used to hit us big time when we first became a believer. But because we've heard it so many times, it kind of is like, it, it doesn't hit us the same way. It's kind of like when you said, I love you to your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife. It doesn't have the same impact anymore. It's not because you love them less. It's just because it's so familiar that it just doesn't seem to have that pizzazz anymore. And that's what I've seen in a lot of believers today. They, they're so comfortable that they, they don't want to study it anymore because they think they know it all. They think that they've heard it all. Or even if it's things that they've heard already, they think they don't need to hear it anymore. And that's far from the truth. Only Satan would want us to believe that. It's like what I've said before. It's like eating steak or any meal that you've tasted already and say, well, I've tried that already. I don't need to hear, taste that again or hear that again. You're missing out. It's the second, third, fourth time that you come around and hit it again and again. All of a sudden, God, the Holy Spirit brings to, to mind something that you may not have heard the first, second or third time around. That's called growth. That's called maturity. That's called adva advancement, spiritual advance. But if you sit there and peel out because you've heard it already, you don't know what you're missing out on. So these things, says the first and the last, who was dead, came to life. That's what he wanted the angel, the pastor of the church in Smyrna. Write these things down. The first and the last who was dead, who came and came to life. Now, verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. John is instructed to write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. The believers there get encouragement based on who Jesus is, Jesus himself. The first and the last. Okay, okay. I think this is a duplicate again. I apologize. He was dead and came back to life. Thus, he can relate to suffering and death at the hands of evil men. Okay, that's just... <clears throat> continuation of my I, I have a few of these that have additional notes to the verse so bear with me here church of smyrna okay the second letter was addressed to smyrna a lot smyrna a large and wealthy city 35 miles north of ephesus like ephesus it was a seaport okay yeah this is uh there was a lot more that i needed to break apart because it wouldn't fit on the one side so in contrast to ephesus which today is a deserted ruin smyrna is still a large seaport with a present population of about two hundred thousand. christ described himself as the first and the last who died and came to life again christ is portrayed as the eternal one 1 8 and 17 21 6 and 22 13 as you survey revelation in those particular chapters who suffered death at the hands of his persecutors and then was re resurrected from the grave okay there you go now i recall a lot of my notes cannot fit on the one slide because it's dense so i'm moving them to the next slide with the same verse on top I've done that several times in this particular chapter because it's, there's a lot of things that I couldn't fit on one slide. So now, the name of the city Smyrna means myrrh, an ordinary perfume. It was also used in the anointing of the tabernacle and the in embalming dead bodies, especially found in Exodus 30, 23, Psalms 45, 8, Song, Song of Solomon 3, 6, Matthew 2.11, Mark 15.23, as well as John 19.39. So while the believers of the church at Smyrna were experiencing the bitterness of suffering, their faithful testimony was like myrrh or sweet perfume to God. So that's this is a very important point right here. So they were suffering, close, some of them near to death. They were so persecuted that they were suffering big time. And they, Jesus said to the pastor of the church, write this down. And the person that came back was dead and came back to life. And so it's a continuation of this encouragement to the church and to the churches and to us 
And look at what I said on the bottom of my notes here. The believers at the church of Smyrna were experiencing the bitterness of suffering. Are any of you suffering? You online, you and Elisa Viejo, listening on YouTube. The faithful testimony was like myrrh or a sweet perfume to God as you remain focused on him, steadfast in his word, in his truth. Suffering is inevitable. You can't escape it. However, stress is optional. Problems and trials are inevitable. They will hit you. But stress is optional. That's up to you. You can stress out or you can have peace that surpasses all understanding, which is contingent upon your volition. Just like here, if you're suffering and uh, the, the difficulties that you're going through can be like myrrh or sweet perfume to God as you remain focused on him, as you remain advancing in him amidst the calamities and the difficulties and the challenges of life, as you remain steadfast in his truth, in his doctrines, you're like myrrh going before the throne of grace, going before the throne of God, and you're like myrrh and a perfume to God. It's pleasant to him as he sees you go through this, not because he desires for you to suffer, but he's going back to Satan saying, see, you can't get Hasman. She remains fixed and focused on my word as you're trying to clobber her and beat her up. She's remaining focused on biblical truth and she's trusting in me. So get the hint, Satan. That's like a sweet perfume rising through to the throne of grace. And so he's telling us this, these snippets of truth found in scripture, sometimes in Revelation, sometimes in Ephesians, sometimes in Romans, sometimes in John. And when we see all of this and we dissect it properly, studying and showing ourselves to prove, we discover that these truths, depending on where they're found, relate to either the Old Testament saints or the New Testament saints, which are uniquely distinct, the dispensation of the law, the dispensation of the church age, and the dispensation of the church age operates completely different from the Old Testament saints. They operate, and we operate differently. We're the only ones throughout scripture that has the ability to flex spiritual muscle. What do I mean by that? We're the only ones throughout the entire canon of scripture, Old and New Testament, Genesis to the back of Revelation, we're the only ones that have access to his spiritual power as a direct result of the indwelling of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, church age believer doctrine. So that when we confess our sins, if there's any grieving that was accomplished prior to coming to church, prior to opening our laptops, prior to opening our phones and engaging with the word, via videos, online, Zoom, face-to-face -face in church or wherever, as we confess our sins, we now immediately have access to the triune Godhead that lives in us. And it's fantastic. And when we don't feel like anything, when we feel like, oh, that's the same thing I've been hearing over and over and over, that's when Satan is winning. He's getting the upper hand when he could so distract us to say, you know what, that's the same stuff we've been hearing over and over and over. Let's hear something else that'll tickle the ears, something different. Well, you know, it's kind of like medicine, isn't it? We sometimes are, we're supposed to take certain medicines, whether it's antibiotics or certain vitamins. We may not like to take it. We may not like the taste, but you know what, if we take it on based on what we're supposed to do, if we're supposed to take it for a week, it'll have its results if you're consistent with it. You can't miss a day and you don't like taking the pills over and over and over for the entire week, the antibiotics, and you're saying, oh my gosh, it's, it's not even working. Well, that's because it's not fully in your system yet and you have to allow it to take part of your uh, system. And sometimes it takes more than one day. It'll take three or four days to finally be a part of you and likewise 
the word of God operates like that as well. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so when we get to this point where we're like, eh, I've read this, I've, I've been reading my Bible for a year. It doesn't seem to work. Well, I'm sorry to say that it, it, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It could be you. It could be how you're studying it. It could be that you're pro studying it improperly. Maybe you're not studying it properly. It's like medicine, isn't it? If you're if you skip a day or two, and you're going to say the medicine doesn't work. It's giving you headaches. Well, how do you know it's the medicine that maybe you're not taking it with food? So if there's something off in what you do with the medicine, could it be that there's something off with you when it comes to the word of God? Are you studying it properly? Are you getting un under the instruction of someone who knows what it's saying rather than someone who thinks they know what it's saying? And that's not that's the reality of where we're living today. It has to be under the guidance of someone who is gifted uh, in the area of, especially like pastor teacher, not everyone is gifted as a pastor teacher. There are, pe there are people behind the pulpits who are quote unquote pastors, but they have never been given the spiritual gift of pastor teacher. And yet they're, they run rampant around the world. There are people behind the pulpit and it's just a shame when they miss their calling and maybe they're an evangelist rather than a pastor, but that's for another study. So the point being in this section here on verse eight, they were, many were experiencing bitterness of suffering, but their faithful, notice the faithful testimony was like myrrh or sweet perfume to God. So our sufferings can be pleasant before God. And it, it sounds kind of bizarre that how could suffering be pleasant before God? Well, it says that it's like perfume or myrrh when you think, when you take it through in this context of chapter two, when you put it all together, that's what it's saying, okay? I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. Notice that. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but you, but are a synagogue of Satan. I know your tribulation and poverty. These are two very strong Greek words. They are significant because the city of Smyrna was very prosperous. The fact that the church was poor seems to apply economic persecution. It is theologically significant, significant that in the book of Revelation, believers suffer tribulations, but unbelievers suffer the wrath of God. So there's a distinction between tribulation, which is hardship, Versus the unbelievers who will suffer the wrath of God. They're not one and the same. They're diff distinct. Believers are always protected. You are always protected as a believer or sealed from divine judgment. But you are rich, spiritually speaking. Believers cannot judge their standing in Christ by worldly standards. You cannot compare. You can't say, well, I don't have a house. I don't have a boat. I don't have a nice car. So therefore I'm, I'm not rich. Well, in the eyes of God, you might be, or you are because you have spiritual assets. You have a heavenly home. You have a mansion waiting for you in my father's house are many mansions and it has your name on it. So you may not feel like you're successful by the standards of the world but we don't base it by the standards of the world we base it by the standards of god based on biblical truth that's replete in the bible but you won't know this unless you get into the bible okay so you can't be you cannot judge the standing your standing by worldly standards you can see matthew 6 33 we're familiar with that seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be handed over to you or added unto you, basically. 10. Do not fear any of those who which you are about to suffer. <clears throat> do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Revelation 2.10. That you may be tested. So please notice. The scripture said the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. 
I think this is during the time in the ancient time in during the time of the churches as revealed in Revelation. But I do believe it's happening today and it will happen again in the future. OK, but please notice that the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. The devil doesn't throw you into prison, but he does use human beings to throw you into prison. So the idea here is when you observe what's there, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison. It's not the devil himself who's reaching for your clothing and chucking you into the prison. But I want you to see that he is using individuals to throw you into prison. There's always someone who is a pawn in the hands of Satan. Okay. So it's very clear in Revelation 2.10. And then some notes here. Do not fear. This is what's called a present middle or passive middle imperative with a negative particle, which meant to stop an act already in the process. These churches were terrified. They were afraid. Persecutions were a sign of their salvation and God's blessing, a sign of their deliverance, a sign of their good standing with God. And so they were being persecuted and they were being reminded that, you know what, these things are going to happen. These churches were afraid. And this was a sign that they were doing the right thing. We've, you've often heard, I believe, I know I have, if you're not, do, if you're not being challenged, if you're not going through hardship, you're not a bother to the devil. Only when, you, <clears throat> only when you're experiencing hardship, going and you're going in the direction of serving God only then will Satan be bugged and bothered and irritated because you are in the way and you're a threat to him he's going to try to knock you out so that you won't be available to him every person who's in the service for God and doing something for God is going to be persecuted is going to throw some of you into prison hopefully not during our time but we're seeing this today. Some people in the Middle East are suffering right now. And here we are. Our only suffering today is, I got to go to church. I got to wake up, go to church. Oh, my gosh. Do I have to bring my Bible today? Shame on you. Shame on you. You don't have any hardship compared to people who are being thrown into jail, being beheaded and killed. You see what's happening over there? You have no problems, ladies and gentlemen. Get busy for the Lord, okay? Don't complain about, oh, I'm sacrificing. I got to wake up. I got to go to church. I got to do this. You have nothing to worry about. You have no problems at all. Believe me. I, I, I Sometimes it, I, it disturbs me when I think about those who think they have problems when in all reality, they don't. They're still breathing. They're still alive. They wake up every day comfortable and they think they have problems. And it's only when a loved one or themselves, when they're captured and they're pleading for their lives and sending text messages, I think they, I may not see you. That's the time they're going to start crying out to God. I will do anything. Just get me out of this. Serve him now. Do something now while you have life and while you have breath. This is, this is not the time to compare, but please. Get busy for God, okay? Do something now, because here in the text of Scripture, we're already being told, this is future in from my estimation, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. This hasn't happened yet, but it will. This happened 2,000 years ago, and it will happen in the future. So if it happened 2,000 years ago and it'll happen in the future, where are we now in the timeline? We're somewhere in the middle. So that means we may see some of us going into prison. We may be sitting here saying, oh, I want to post bail. I want to, I can pay myself out of prison. Don't wait for that. Start working for the Lord now. Don't wait until you're thrown into prison and then you're going to cry your best and say, oh, Lord, I promise, I promise, I promise. Because at that point, it'll be too late and possibly, depending on the severity of who's throwing you into prison, who's capturing you, you may not have another chance. And that's how bad it is, folks.
it's getting that direction. I've sent some of you some videos where there's things going on around the world and it's not getting any better. So please don't be lackadaisical and just say, well, I'm just going to pray that God won't allow me to go through sufferings. Well, if that's your case and that's your fate, great. But my hunch is that as we continue to focus on him, and even if you, some of you don't focus on him, there's no saying you still won't suffer because the world is going awry and it's just hitting everybody and anybody. So you might be a target anyways. So you might as well be on the side of God, be on the side of Jesus and start serving him now. At least before you leave, you're, you can honestly say you gave it your best on this side of eternity. So there will be some who are going to go into prison. We're actually seeing that right now. When this was recorded, this was 2,000 years ago, folks. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. So listen, look at what it says. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Why? That you may be tested. So he's going to throw you into prison to test you. So there's, a, there's a testing that comes from the Lord. And there's a testing that's going to come from Satan himself, the adversary. And you will have tribulation for 10 days. 10 days. That's a little over a week. Again, written 2,000 years ago. But yet... It's speaking to us as if it's now. And I believe it's just around the corner. Present, middle, passive imperative. So it's either a middle or passive imperative. So this is what's forthcoming, folks. And this was written 2,000 years ago. And we're seeing this now unfolding right before our eyes. We know people who have been thrown into prison. Some didn't make it into prison because they died before they got to prison. So don't wait for that time because I'm sure they were not expecting to be thrown into prison. They were not expecting to die prematurely. So don't play devil and say, or don't play God and say, oh, I'm not going to die. I'm here in America and I'm going to live. When you have that kind of attitude, that's when you get caught by surprise. Don't think that way, folks. Verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What's he saying? He's saying, look, if you have an ear, and we do, pay attention. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. The second death. So overcomes is the idea of overcoming the trials just mentioned. So he who overcomes shall not be hurt, shall not be hurt by the second death. What is, what is he talking about? What's he referring to when he talks about the second death? He's talking about eternal separation. So he's basically, here's another way of encouraging us. He's saying, look, as long as you overcome these tribulations, throwing it, being thrown into prison to be tested, if you overcome that, guess what? If you don't make it, physically speaking, at least you won't be hurt by the second death, which is separated into the lake of fire. Isn't that great news? It is great news, but we first have to overcome. So that means there's going to be massive, major, major tribulation that is going to come our way, or at least in the ways of the churches, and we may escape, we may not. The, the tribulations that is delineated here in Revelation 2, some of it, um, by the time we get to chapter 3, we will be gone because we're going to be raptured out of here, which praise the Lord. But some of the tribulations that we're reading about here up, apply to the churches in the sense that the tribulation prior to the rapture is going to be hitting us hard. So we're seeing that there's certain tribulations, the baby tribulations, the smaller tribulations that will hit us. This is, has nothing to do with the Antichrist, by the way. This is not talking about taking the mark of the beast. That's during the tribulation, which we will be gone because the church will not be subjected to the wrath of God, which is going to be clearly seen in the tribulation period. However, we will undergo the smaller tribulation, lowercase t, not uppercase t tribulation, where it, in, it involves persecutions, false doctrine, and also being thrown into 
prison for 10 days. The idea there is for a certain amount of time, but we will overcome, as we overcome that, we will not be hurt by the second death. Another way of saying, look, Jasmine, you're going to be okay. You know, they're going to throw you, you're they're going to, they're going to throw you into prison, but you know what, Tess, Theta, you're going to be okay because it's only 10 days anyways, but as long as you overcome it, you will not be hurt by the second death. Isn't that great news? Yes. But in the meantime, what are we doing to ensure that we won't be impacted by these smaller tribulations? The truth is, like I said earlier, problems and trials are inevitable, but stress is optional. And what I mean by that is stress is contingent upon your volition. As the problems hit you, you can either say, well, Lord, I'm going to count this all joy, not because this is a joyful occasion or a joyful moment, but because I know that I can trust you amidst it all. I know that you'll cause everything to work together for good as I'm resting in your promises, resting in your doctrine. I know that my sufferings is going up before the throne of grace as myrrh or a perfume. And so, Lord, <clears throat> I'm going to continue to trust you because as this perfume or myrrh is going before the throne of grace, it's not that it's a real stink or a real smell going before the, before the throne of grace, but it's a way of describing how pleasant it is when your sons and daughters continue to remain steadfast in your word, in your doctrine, in spite of what's going on around us. And so not only does the unbelieving world get to see this, but you, above all people, get to see your creatures, your sons and daughters, continue to stay in the game, trusting in your word, trusting in the proper doctrines as set forth by the word of God, listening to the word of God, applying the word of God, so that as we do, we're bringing glory and honor to you and you alone. And it, it is like myrrh going before you. It's like a beautiful perfume going before your nostrils. And you're taking, you're, you're enjoying and basking in all of this because it's a way of saying, Father, we are trusting in your, your care and your protection. We're not moved at all. We're confident in who we placed our faith in. We're confident in the provisions that you'll provide. We're confident that because you rose on the third day, we can trust you in spite of what's going on because we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. We're ultimately confident that when everyone is disobeying us and di things are not going right, our sons and daughters are not listening to us, things are not going the way we would want them to, but because you rose on the third day, you're alive, you conquered death, we can place our faith and trust in you that in due time, in your perfect time, you're going to work things out because you're in control anyways. Every detail in life is orchestrated and managed by your will and your omnipotence. So we thank you, Lord. All of that is based on the few verses that we've just read. That was just a message that I pulled from all of this as we went through this together, folks. That's what happens when you study it closely. You internalize it several times. And that's what it looks like to be able to navigate through the challenges of life. I'm not sitting here, no, I better, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to send everyone a, I'm going to tell Jenny to put this out in the prayer list. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm going through hardship, please. Tell everybody to pray for me. I'm just really having a bad day. Look, we all have bad days, right? I'm not saying that that's um, a bad thing. That doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. That doesn't mean you're not a believer in Christ who has faith. But I am saying that if you were able to come up and re recite what I just said, and I, I don't mean you have to say it verbatim, but if you're able to say, well, based on the few verses we've read, um, he, ran, he, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes the trials shall not be hurt by the second death. So if you can say collectively, individually, one by one, wherever you are in life, that when your son, daughter, husband, wife are not listening to you, cooperating with you, and you feel like giving up, you can say, 
Well, based on the study today, I'm confident that the person who, is, who has recorded that some of us are going to be thrown into jail, sometimes for a period of seven days, 10 days or more or less, he sees it all and he records it. Just like James counted all joy. When you know all of these truths in the back of your head, in the back of your soul, like it's a real part of you, you know the Bible more than you know your name, then my friends, you can stand up to anything. You can stand up to any Goliath in life. As you're standing and facing him off the enemy, you can say, well, not that I'm greater than Goliath or greater than the devil, but I, my the, the person greater is living in me. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. And when you can say that with utmost confidence, I assure you, there is nothing in this world that is going to topple you over. You're going to be able to stay in the game, stay in the fight and say, you know what? To God be the glory. And you know what? I know that it is God who is going to fight my battles. Did he not say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord? He did. He certainly did. And I have just given you an example of a little Pastor Freddie how he does it, and as he's pulled several verses together right on the fly and say, this is what I would do. He's telling us to, that we can overcome it. He's going to be thrown into jail <coughs> for a period of 10 days, sometimes less, sometimes more. But if you overcome it, as 2.11 says, you shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, why does he say overcome it? Because he knows that some of us will go through severe tribulations. Not the uppercase tribulation like what we see in Revelation 3, 6, and 7, but the smaller ones that might cause us to cave in and implode and say, I want to give up. He doesn't want us to give up. He wants that perfume and myrrh to continue to go before the throne of grace. And the only way that does, that's going to happen is if we stand our ground. Steadfast in the word, folks. Confident in him placing our faith in him as we know his word, which is why we have enough classes now to get this inculcated in your soul. We have a Tuesday night. We have a Wednesday night. We have a Thursday night. We have enough classes. We have a women's class that is being taught aptly by someone who is devoting her life and time to dispense it as she has learned it throughout the years and as she's coming through material, as am I, we have several classes available to you all so that you can get to the point in your spiritual life, your spiritual walk, so that when you get hit with problems, and you will, by the way, you will, okay? It's clear in scripture in this particular chapter, as we're moving through this, that it's going to be just a matter of time. And then you're going to say, oh, I better text Jenny. Uh, I need prayers. Some of it, yes, is going to call for prayer. A lot of it is going to be con contained and dealt with properly when you know what the word of God has to say about your circumstances. I've said this multiple times on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursday nights. Some of you have missed it. I don't know why you miss it. You should be there. And I'm surprised some of you don't make it. I don't know why you don't prioritize this. But like I've said before, your prayer life would be adjusted when you know what the Bible doctrine says, the doctrine of God's word says. Many people are praying for things that they don't even have to pray for because God has already discussed it in his word. But you don't know that because you haven't been in his word enough. You may have known about some basic truths, but if you're not consistent in it, you're not going to get it. There's not enough time in this lifetime to inculcate the small portion of the New Testament. I'm not talking about Old Testament. I'm talking about New Testament. Why am I saying New Testament? It's not that the Old Testament has no value. The New Testament is the books written for the church age believers to help us navigate and go through life now. The Old Testament doesn't supply the power, the punching power, the horsepower to get through life. You can't go through the Old Testament and, and live by the Ten Commandments and say, oh, I'm spiritual now. The Old Testament was never designed to supply you with power. The Old Testament just shows how much we fall short, God's glory. 
It was never designed to show us how to live the spiritual life. It shows us how we fall short. However, in the New Testament, God supplies the horsepower to live out that life. But it's contingent upon a daily intake of the living word of God, where the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the word that doesn't come back void, but you have to inculcate it. If you're not inculcated, it's like equivalent to not eating. How long can you live without eating once, twice, or three times a week? That's just going to cause you to shrivel up. Some of you would have headaches galore. Some of you can't even stand on your own two feet if you don't eat for a few days. And you sit there and think you can stand when you don't get into the word on a regular basis, thought methodically, categorically, exegetically, you're missing out. That's why we made it available. I made it available Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Join us. The link is there. You should join us. There's so much that other, we have 20 plus people during the week absorbing it, not even a part of Church of Hope because they're hungry. And I would strongly encourage you all to get into it too. Why? So that I can hear my, so I can, you can hear me talk. No, it's for your spiritual advance, spiritual edification. I care enough to say this so that you'll be challenged to say, look, come together, assemble, because it's now available. Whether we're talking about Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or even the women's class for the women's group. The women should be assembling and fellowshipping because it's just a matter of time, feet in the air, we're gone. And then God's going to say, what did you do? All the studies were available. What did you do? It was properly dispensed at the appropriate times. What did you do? So I'm telling you now, while we have time, while we're here alive on this side of eternity, take advantage of it now. Not too many churches are teaching solid doctrine. We are. We have it available. Here in Virginia, they're glad that I'm teaching it. They're glad that I'm making it available. They see the value. The people who know what the word of God does for the believer in Christ, they gravitate towards it. That's why I have to do Wednesdays here too. They see the value in it. They're asking, would you please cover on Wednesday? When people are positive, it's hard to say no. <sighs> Folks, it's available. It's available. I don't know why we don't have more people showing up, especially during this time and age. You guys are more interested in end times, but you should be interested in Bible doctrine because that's what's going to stabilize your life. You cannot make it without this word, the word of God. This is the word of God, but this is talking about something that we won't even face. So what you are facing can only be dealt with properly with Bible doctrine, the written word, which comes from the epistles, the book of Romans on, because it infuses us with the power that comes from God, the Holy Spirit. So we have communion Sunday today. So this is where we will conclude on Revelation 2, 11, and then we'll resume this next week. So let me just... <clears throat> Close in a word of prayer, and then we'll partake in communion together. I ask that you retain the elements, and I'll, I think someone will let, cue me when we're when everyone has the elements. But let's close in prayer, and then we'll partake in communion together. Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to assemble together. I know, Lord, I get passionate at times, but I do sense, and I've said this before, that the rapture is just around the corner. And Lord, as we pull together as believers in Christ, I know that the adversary is going to try to distract us away from your word. And so, Father, the only way to combat that is to stand firm and to remind everybody of the importance of getting into the word of God. I am the shepherd, I am the pastor, and as such, it is my job to remind people over and over and over to get into the spiritual vitamins that's found in your word. So I'm grateful for your word, and I pray now, Lord, that you would help us to remember these truths and that we would assemble together each and every week as we um, join our studies and church every Sunday. Father, we're about to partake in communion, and I pray for those who are online 
if they're going to partake, that they would have the, the juice or wine and bread available. And we will we ask all of these things through Christ's name. Amen. All right. I Apparently, you guys have the elements, and that is great. So let me read something from God's word for preparation for communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 with 23 says, I have received from the Lord that which I have delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he betrayed took bread. So let's take the cracker or bread. And um, let me read one last thing here. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember him. <clears throat> in the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us remember him. And he concludes when discussing this with his disciples by saying, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So there's a forward looking and a backward looking sense when we partake in communion. We look back to the cross, what he accomplished through the bread and the juice or the wine which symbolizes his body and blood, which was shed on the cross, broken on the cross, so that we might have salvation. But then we think forward until he comes um, during the rapture, okay? So every time we partake in this, it's designed to encourage us. What he did 2,000 years ago was for our salvation, and we can look forward because his salvation has been completed, and he says he will come for us. He will take us away so that the next major event, according to the chronology of God's word, is to be the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And that's what we're going to see in the future coming of our study in Revelation. Let us pray, and then we'll conclude our service. Father, thank you, as always, for giving us this opportunity to partake in communion. We are forever grateful for what you have accomplished on the cross because of Jesus we have life everlasting. And Father, it's my uh, prayer that those online and in person in Elisa Viejo that, um, and those listening, that those who are in Christ, those who are believers in Christ, that we would take seriously all those things that we have shared and discussed. And especially uh, concluding with communion, Father, we just have this sense that you truly do love us and the world who are opposed to your son, Jesus Christ. But Father, I pray and exhort everyone listening to this right now that we would make it a point to share the gospel, that they can have life everlasting by simply believing in Jesus for it. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for extending grace to us, even when we are not worthy. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you all during the week or next week, Sunday. God bless you all. Take care. Bye-bye.